Has anyone ever said anything really weird about your body while you've been breastfeeding your babies? I can tell you that over the years as a lactation professional and as a nursing parent, I have heard some very weird things about breasts. And I find it to be incredibly unhelpful to people who are trying to feed their babies, especially people in the early days and weeks and months as they are gaining confidence. So I'm going to talk about it today because this is a huge barrier to feeding our babies because what it does is plant doubt instead of confidence. So let's get into it. I have a really busy week coming up and I thought what better way to reduce my stress than to go onto feastandfettle.com and order meals for that week so I can just take one thing off of my plate by putting delicious meals onto my plate. See what I did there? So I went on to their website. It's really easy to use. I looked at all of the menu options for the week and some of the things I'm excited about are some grilled steak tips with a delicious Thai peanut sauce and some green beans with a soy sesame sauce that's on the side, but there's so many other things. And that is one of the ways that I am choosing to provide self-care for myself so that I can reduce my stress load. If you would like to do the same and spend more time with your family and less time worrying about what's for dinner, go to feastandfettle.com to get home cooked meals delivered right to your front door. And you can get $30 off your first week's delivery by using my code MILK, M-I-L-K. And just let somebody else cook for you. You won't regret it. Okay. Some of the things I hear come from family members. Some of the things come from professionals. Some come from the clients themselves. There is growing acceptance of bodies of all sorts in our society. I don't think we're fully there yet. But I think we're getting closer. I love that I can go to the library and that my kids can check out books that feature bodies of all kinds. As a person with a disability, I love that yesterday when I went to the library with my kids, I was able to find a book just sitting on the shelf and featured right on the cover was a kid who had only one leg on the cover. And the title of the book was something like, what's wrong with you? And so this is a question I got a lot as a kid. And so we have a growing comfortability with a variety of bodies. I think many of us who are raising kids today are raising kids to be comfortable with various body sizes. We are raising kids who love their bodies as they are. We have a better understanding of the dangers, for instance, of the diet culture that we grew up in and what it did for our own psyche, seeing our grown-ups all around us constantly trying to change their bodies and then what that did for us. And we have an awareness of how, a better awareness of how we can talk about food in front of our children and what food does for our bodies, at least in the circles that I often am in. However, I find that we are still lagging behind in breastfeeding culture. And I think this is because we still really are pretty prudish when it comes to comfortability around our own breasts. As my audience is quite aware, one of the questions I always ask my guests and frequently when I ask my own clients, How frequently have you seen other people feed babies with their own bodies? How up close and personal have you gotten to that? Have you just seen people feed from a distance on a bench with a cover? Or have you 
actually seen somebody adjusting a baby? Have you seen somebody unlatch and relatch because it hurt? Have you seen a variety of positions that babies can feed in? And how frequently have you seen this? Because if the first time we see a baby feeding is from our own bodies, and if the first time we see it frequently and up close and personal, it is going to be more difficult. And I've talked about this very frequently over the course of the podcast. This is part of why it makes feeding difficult. Another reason feeding is difficult is because we have this prudish idea about breasts needing to be covered. And the way that we talk about breasts is still very unhelpful when it comes to how we think about what their primary purpose is and how they are able to feed babies. And not only how we talk about breasts when we are feeding the babies, but how we talk about breasts throughout the course of human development throughout the course of the development of the person who is growing the breasts. And so for instance, I have one boy and one girl as children. And when we go swimming, I do like for both of them to be covered up because I don't like them to get sun exposure and to have sunburns. But if I am going to allow my son who has not hit puberty yet to take off his shirt to go swimming, I also allow my daughter to do that. They look the same when they take their shirts off. There's no reason why my son can show his nipples, but not my daughter. Their nipples look exactly the same. And I am around quite a few other families who do that exact same thing. However, I am surrounded by many other families who feel quite shocked by this, that I allow my daughter to expose her nipples in public while swimming, even though they don't bat an eye when my son is able to do the same thing. And so we still have this sense that our children who have not hit puberty yet, who have no breast buds to speak of, I'm talking about a five-year-old, can show their nipples, even though their nipples really serve no purpose at this point. And that's quite shocking to me. And in other cultures, I have a friend who grew up in West Africa, and to her, what was most important was covering her legs. She and her mom, even after she hit puberty, there was no problem walking around uncovered with either no shirt or no shirt and no bra. That was totally acceptable because it was very hot, and often they would do that, but it was expected to cover their legs and to wear long skirts at all times. And so the legs were really viewed as the item of sexuality, which we could discuss whether or not this was appropriate. But to me, if we're going to sexualize a part of a body, that makes more sense because the mammary glands, the breasts, are used for feeding babies. And in that culture, there was way less difficulty feeding babies because the breasts were able to be exposed. People saw breasts all the time. They were out and they were available for the babies to feed. Okay, so that is my introduction to this topic. And then here are some of the things that I hear people say about their breasts when they are talking about whether or not they will be able to breastfeed. When I work in the hospital, I am an avid podcast listener. And in the past year and a half of doing this, have now realized how much I can help the little guys out by rating and reviewing their shows. If you are listening to this, then you are someone who has enjoyed the show please take a moment to rate and review and let me know that you've enjoyed it. That's how more and more people can find it. Thanks. I'm just there two days a month, but I go in, I 
go to the lactation office. I see how many people are on the unit. I look and see how many of them plan to breastfeed. We're able to note inside the chart what their breast condition is, if they've had any surgeries or not, although this is not always noted by other people, but there is an opportunity in the chart to be able to say this. And then the next thing we do after, this takes me about an hour to go through and see who are all of my clients versus the certified lactation counselor who's on. And then we go and we round and we talk to all the nurses we can find to see who are your patients and who do you think we should prioritize and who, what have they said about how feeding is going and how do you think feeding is going? And I hear things like, A common phrase I hear is, she has really good equipment. And to me, I think this is such a funny phrase. What does it mean for a person to have good equipment to feed their baby? That means nothing. But the people who are telling me that she has good equipment, they're nurses and they work on a postpartum floor. What I think what they are trying to say is that they have big, full breasts with protruding nipples, so they should be able to feed, versus, I don't know, nipples that might be smaller, or maybe inverted nipples, or flat nipples, but to tell somebody that they have good equipment or bad equipment for feeding, I don't think a nurse would ever say to somebody, I hope not at least, that you have bad equipment. But to say that somebody has good equipment means that then there are people who have bad equipment for feeding. And that just does not play out in the research. We do know that there are some breast shapes that are indicative of hormonal difficulties. So there are some breast shapes that will trigger the lactation consultant, the educated lactation consultant to say, I need to dig deeper here because there may be a history of infertility. There may be a history of hormonal difficulties that will then lead me to know that this person may have more trouble with milk supply, but to describe somebody's anatomy when it comes to breastfeeding as having good or bad equipment is not helpful to that person unless you are conducting some sort of research study. Then you might be able to argue that you are trying to create some sort of rating, but that's not what nurses are doing. And I don't think... I don't know if they are necessarily saying this to the person themselves because this isn't a conversation between a lactation consultant and a nurse, but I still don't find it helpful. It would be more helpful to say the patient has round breasts with large nipples, a size 21 millimeter approximately, but they don't measure. They are uh, everted without stimulation or flat, but evert easily with stimulation, or they are flat, but they do evert with difficulty, or the right side is everted, but the left side is inverted. We have not been able to evert them with stimulation. So there are ways to describe the quote unquote equipment or the mammary glands and the nipples it, with neutral terms that could be beneficial to the lactation consultant or the professional that is coming in, but that is not the way that I am hearing it. The other ways that I hear people's bodies being described are she has huge nipples she has tiny nipples she has really a flat chest talking about 
in pregnancy, the nipples being inverted or everted without giving additional information. So it is good for the OBGYN or the midwife to do a breast exam and to talk about breast history, to talk about development over time of the breasts. Were there any difficulties? Did you notice one side developing more than the other? Did your breasts develop as you would say normally? Were you worried about your breast development? Is there anything you are worried about? Did you feel the need to get implants? Have you had a breast reduction? These are things that could impact supply. But what is not helpful is just to tell somebody, oh, you have an inverted or a flat nipple. And then to move on with the conversation because then that seed of doubt gets planted in the pregnant person or the person who is now trying to feed a baby if you're just now telling them for the first time. And now they don't know if that flat or inverted nipple means they will no longer be able to feed their baby. The other thing that I frequently hear is people saying that they have elastic nipples. Now, there is wide variability in how stretchy people's nipples can be. However, elastic nipples is not really a diagnosis. And often when somebody's nipples are stretching really far into the tunnel of a pump, it is most likely because they are not in the proper phalange size. And that is a time when you could be working with a qualified lactation consultant. We are not all created equal. So if you go to somebody and you are still in pain or your nipple is still banging on the end of the tunnel after you work with them, then you probably need to see somebody else, which I know can get expensive. And so you can say to them, look, my nipple is really stretchy. It's banging on the end of the tunnel. What would you do in this situation? And the answer should be, I have a variety of phalange sizes. I have a variety of tools that we can use on the end of the phalange to try to see if we can give you not only the exact right fit for your body and for your pump, but also I have additional tools that you can use while pumping to see if we can make it more comfortable so that your nipple is not binging on the edge of the tunnel. Because to tell somebody that they have elastic nipples is to indicate that there is something wrong with their body, which is not true. The nipple is meant to stretch far back into the baby's mouth so that it is not rubbing on the top of the hard palate when the baby is feeding. And it is a good thing when nipples stretch. The problem is the pumping equipment, not the nipple. The problem is typically that the tunnel is too short or that the phalange is too big and too much areola is being brought into the tunnel, which is allowing that nipple to bang on the end. I just had a situation the other day where I went to see a client, she has damage on the end of her nipple. And when I compared some of the phalanges I had with the phalange she had been using, her tunnel was much shorter. And when I got her in the proper phalange size with a longer tunnel, she was able to pump 
without having her nipple bang on the end of the tunnel. But if I were to just say to her, oh, you have elastic nipples, that indicates there is a flaw with your body and there is nothing to be done about it. Instead of saying, oh man, let's see if we can find equipment that is better used with your body, with the anatomy that your body is presenting so that you are more comfortable expressing milk. And if for some reason there isn't a tunnel long enough, I have a milk drop cushion that you can add, which creates a little more length. There are things that we can do. And if that's not working, we could go the route of trying to get really good at hand expressing. There are other things that can be done. But if someone just tells you, yeah, you're flawed, you don't have the right equipment to express milk for your baby, how discouraging is that? And then that idea gets put in your head that your body isn't good enough for your baby. And we know that over human history, there has been a wide variety of human bodies that have fed a wide variety of human babies, big mouths, small mouths, large breasts, small breasts, large nipples, small nipples, inverted nipples, everted nipples. So it is possible with the right supports. So if you are somebody who is looking for the right support, if you have been told that your body is flawed, I am here to tell you that is not the case. Now, we do know that there are sometimes medical issues that can impact milk supply, that can impact the ability for a baby to feed or the ability for us to feed our babies. But if someone has just given you a blanket statement about what your body looks like without providing additional support or information, you might be operating on flawed information. And I would love to be the person who helps you rethink your body's ability to provide milk for your baby. Or if you have already ended your baby feeding journey and you would like to discuss, you know what? I had this idea that my body couldn't do it. And I want to talk to Lo about whether or not there were some flaws in the way that people discussed my body with me. I would love to talk to you about that. So reach out to me, www.quabinbirthservices.com. Also, I am spreading the word that I am going to start a third type of podcast. Anyone who listens to the show knows I have my episodes where people share their intense baby feeding stories that highlight implicitly all the barriers that make feeding our baby so difficult. They share their triumphant stories and they share their difficult ones and they share the ones that are a little bit in between. And these stories are important. And then there are the episodes like this, where I share information that help people to overcome the barriers by unpacking the barriers, or by helping people understand some aspect of baby feeding a little bit better. I would like to start a third segment where I do some on-air lactation consulting, so that people can get a sense of what some compassionate, knowledgeable lactation consults sound like. So I want to do this with people who I would not be able to bill their insurance for to begin with. Because if I could bill your insurance, let's have a private consult and let's let's do that so that I can support my business. 
and be able to keep the podcast up as well. But if you are somebody, probably if you have state health care, they make it really hard for me to bill. So I probably can't bill if you have state health care anywhere. Or if you go to my website, www.coavinverseservices.com, and your insurance is not listed on there as one of the insurance companies that I can bill, most likely you are a good candidate for this segment of my show. So if you have a lactation question or you know somebody that does, you've been thinking about weaning, you would like some prenatal education before your next baby, you are worried about your milk supply, you've been getting repeated and recurrent bouts of mastitis, and you would like to do some lactation consulting, and you don't mind doing that and being recorded for both the podcast and for my YouTube presence over telehealth, over video, reach out to me and let's make that happen. So with that, and let's make that happen. And finally, now that school has started and we are all so busy, if you need to order Feast and Fettel so that you have one less thing to do, you can use my code M-I-L-K. And this is for people who live in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. And you can get $30 off. So there's nothing to lose. Try it out. You can order it just on the busy weeks and have home-cooked meals delivered right to your front door. Try it out and let me know what you think. Have a great week. Bye.